the clock is ticking, so I'm going to go ahead and get right into it um, and talk to you guys today about the multi-system effects of severe traumatic brain injury. And the bottom line is, is that uh, just like Dr. Um, we were talking earlier, Craig was talking about the fact that if you pay attention to just a few slides in the lecture, this really is a, the part of the greatest part of the take-home message. And that is recognizing the difference between primary and secondary brain injury, because it really defines the why of why we do lots of different things we do to take care of patients with severe traumatic brain injury. And it really provides the rationale for a uh, a lot of why these different multi-system complications come back and help these patients to have, uh, actually don't help them, but actually make them have worse neurologic outcome. Not all injury occurs at the time of impact. Really, prevention's the only thing. There's no special super glue or anything that we have to actually put neurons that are totally ripped apart back together. But we know that that initial injury and ischemia actually triggers a whole intracellular pathologic cascade of events that eventually can cause cells that are initially just damaged but not completely destroyed, can cause them to eventually die. And we call that secondary brain injury. And we know that there are a number of factors that can actually exacerbate secondary brain injury. And those include the following, and there's lots of them. The first are the four H's, hypoxia, which is defined as a PaO2 of less than 60, hypercapnia, systemic hypotension, which in the literature has historically been defined as a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, but we know we need a blood pressure to have sufficient cerebral perfusion pressure, intracranial hypertension, and there's many others. Seizure activity can increase metabolic demand, making ischemia more likely. We also know that infection can cause uh, more secondary brain injury. Also, hypo or hyperglycemia, fever, causes worse outcome from brain injury. Fluid and electrolyte imbalances, anemia, when we have inadequate oxygen carrying capacity to get that essential nutrient to the brain. Hypocapnia acid base imbalance and coagulopathies. So lots of different things that can actually exacerbate and cause more secondary brain injury. So the take home message is, is that some neurons are compromised functionally, but not completely mechanically destroyed with initial brain impact. When given an optimal environment, those neurons may be able to survive and recover function. But those same neurons are very, very vulnerable to all of that, those various different factors that I mentioned that tend to exacerbate secondary brain injury. So the whole focus of our interventions in caring for these patients are around preventing secondary brain injury. With that said, we know that we don't just take care of the head. This is the only case study I could find where just the head survived. Uh, but the bottom line is, is there's a whole body connected to the patient. And what I'm going to really focus on is how the brain actually triggers numerous multi-system complications that by virtue of the various different problems that crop up with those uh, systemic complications come back and increase mortality and morbidity from tra severe traumatic brain injury. Now, we all know in our practice we can give lots of anecdotal examples of how we've seen this clinically, but in the literature, uh, just to give a quick review, this is what the literature actually shows about non-neurologic organ dysfunction and its association with severe traumatic brain injury. Back in 1992, Pike and his colleagues looked at 734 patients with severe traumatic brain injury who had been entered into the trauma coma data bank. And most frequently, those patients had fluid and electrolyte imbalances, although that didn't really alter outcomes. But there were significant independent risk factors that did impact outcomes from pneumonias, shock, coagulopathy, and septicemia. And pulmonary, cardiovascular, electrolyte disorders, coagulopathy, tended to occur most frequently as complications following severe traumatic brain injury within the first two to four days, whereas infections tend to peak more around day five to 11. Complications that impacted the GI system, renal and hepatic complications, the onset tended to vary.
Zeigen and his colleagues published an article in 2005 that actually looked at 209 consecutive patients with severe traumatic brain injury that had their multi-system organ dysfunction score calculated daily. And what they found was that 89% had at least one non-neurologic organ dysfunction primarily in the respiratory system, 81%, over 50% in the cardiovascular system, 36% had to do with coagulation, 8% hepatic, and 7% in renal. 35% had organ system failures, and again, we see the respiratory system followed by cardiovascular and then coagulation problems as the top three failures that occurred. So non-neurologic organ dysfunction is independently associated with hospital mortality and worse neurologic outcome is what Zygen and his colleagues showed. Masia published in 2008 373 patients with neurologic diagnoses from various different European countries. Only 41% had traumatic brain injury, but although their patients were younger with fewer comorbidities, they developed ICU-acquired sepsis and respiratory failure more frequently than non-neurologic patients. They had higher ICU and hospital mortality rates and longer ICU lengths of stay. Kemp also published an article in 2008 that was a retrospective review of the trauma registry at Vanderbilt, um, looked at the year of 2004, and patients with a head ASI, AIS of three or greater due to traumatic brain injury that actually died during their initial hospitalization were the ones that they took a look at in their, de in their actual registry. And they had a total of 135 patients that met this criteria. Again, similar to what we saw in other studies, the prevalence of at least one non-neurologic organ dysfunction or failure was 81%. Non-neurologic organ dysfunction contributed to about two-thirds of all deaths after severe traumatic brain injury, and 25% died from purely primarily non-neurologic causes, again, primarily pulmonary or cardiovascular. And then Pelosi had actually done a study looking at 552 mechanically ventilated neurologic patients, about 190 actually had tr traumatic brain injury, and found that respiratory complications were the, by far and away the most frequent extracranial complication fo followed by the cardiovascular system. And then Lee had an interesting finding. He looked at 136 patients with severe traumatic brain injury and 31%, about 20, excuse me, 23%, 31 patients had acute kidney injury. And even seemingly insignificant reduced renal function was associated with worse outcomes. So we clearly see that relationship has been well established between severe traumatic brain injury, impact on other body systems, and impact on neurologic outcome, mortality, and morbidity. So why does this occur? Why does the brain cause other body systems to become dysfunctional or to fail? Well, first of all, there are some neurogenic mechanisms. We know, for example, that when the brain has severe injury, there can be hypothalamic stress that can cause catecholamine release, can lead to problems with uh, such as neurogenic pulmonary edema or a stunned myocardium. We'll talk about those briefly. Uh, we also know that uh, when you have injury around the posterior pituitary hypothalamic region, you can have the patient have uh, antidiuretic hormone imbalance that leads to fluid and electrolyte disorders. And there's also resulting deficits that occur when the brain is injured. Patients become immobilized, so they're set up for complications of immobility. They also have problems with protective airway reflexes, making them prone to things like aspiration, which of course is going to increase the likelihood of respiratory complications. Also, we know that when the brain is injured, there's lots of tissue factor that's put out, and so they coagulation cascade is really triggered. And little microthrombi form, and they can actually go to various different organs and cause them to become dysfunctional. Um, then, of course, we consume those coagulation factors, and we can have problems with coagulopathy. For years, the brain was thought to be immunologically uh, really 
to have nothing to do with the immune system at all. It was thought to have, be, uh, you know, have nothing at all to do with that function. With that said, we now know that in the inflammatory response that's triggered by brain injury is actually a mediator of secondary brain injury. And we know that pro-inflammatory mediators that are put out by the brain when it's injured actually are not just seen in the brain, they're seen in the systemic circulation. So they promote a systemic inflammatory response. We also, in treating these patients, uh, put the patient at risk for other complications as well. We know that things like propofol can cause propofol infusion syndrome. Um, we know that, uh, dr that uh, various different lines and monitoring strategies that we use can put the patient at risk for infection and so on and so forth. So the consequences of non-neurologic organ dysfunction increase mortality and morbidity and increase secondary brain injury and can cause, of course, worse neurologic outcomes. So with that said, let's talk briefly, and I decided to prioritize these because uh, clearly we could talk about this for quite some time, uh, but with looking at how we were going to, how I wanted to tailor this, it made sense to look at the organs that tend to fail the, the most in these patients. So let's take a look at the pulmonary and cardiovascular system first. So with the pulmonary system, we have a patient with severe traumatic brain injury that tends to be very, very prone to different pulmonary complications. That can include airway obstruction, atelectasis, pulmonary infections, neurogenic pulmonary edema, ARDS, and pulmonary emboli. I just wanted to spend a second talking about neurogenic pulmonary edema, uh, it's something that we do see from time to time, but it's usually associated with fairly severe traumatic brain injury that often has uh, intracranial hypertension along with it. It can occur within seconds or within a couple weeks after traumatic brain injury, and the exact etiology is not really known. The most likely uh, etiology for this phenomenon, though, is that catecholamine release that I spoke of earlier, causing s both systemic and pulmonary vasoconstriction, increasing pulmonary capillary pressure, and causing pulmonary capillary damage, increasing permeability, and pulmonary edema. Others suggest that it's actually just the increase in vessel permeability in the lung that may cause this phenomenon. We also know that ARDS can happen quite a bit. It can be triggered by direct insult to the lungs, such as aspiration at the time of injury, or indirect, perhaps hypotension or hypoxia that occurs at the time of injury. But that systemic inflammatory response is really thought to play a pretty big role in that ARDS development when it does occur. I just want to point out another case in point of how our interventions can truly make a difference in some of these complication onsets. Um, historically, you all may remember back that there was a time where we had in the guidelines for management of severe traumatic brain injury to try to keep the cerebral perfusion pressure above 70. That was until Claudia Robertson and her colleagues published a study in 1999 where they did a randomized controlled trial. They entered 100 patients into the ICU. ICP protocol arm, and in those patients that kept the ICP below 20, they kept the mean arterial blood pressure just above 70, and the perfusion pressure they were content as long as it was above 50 millimeters of mercury. The PACO2 was kept at about 25 to 30, and they did treat systemic hypertension. In the other arm, they put 89 patients, and in that arm, they kept the ICP below 20, but now they used fluids and vasoactive agents to keep the mean arterial blood pressure higher to maintain a perfusion pressure of greater than 70 millimeters of mercury. The PACO2 was kept around 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury, and there was no treatment for systemic hypertension. And what they showed was that the risk of cerebral ischemia was too 0.4 times more likely in the ICP arm of the study, yet the neurological, the neurological outcome between these two arms proved to be the same. There was no difference. Part of the reason they believe was that they did treat SJO2, saturation of jugular venous oxygen, in both arms, but they found a five times greater incidence of ARDS in the arm where they really gave more fluid, more vasoactive agents to get that mean arterial blood pressure and perfusion pressure higher. And so that really did change the recommendations in the guidelines. <clears throat> 
In a retrospective review of Claudia Robertson's study, Cotton found that there were independent risk factors that could be associated with the onset of ARDS. And he determined those included administration of epinephrine, larger than median doses of dopamine, so again, more vasoactives, history of drug abuse, and a midline shift on the first CT scan. So the, the actual consequences of these respiratory complications are clearly an increase in mortality and morbidity and greater secondary brain injury is possible as well when hypoxia and hypercapnia occur. Pneumonia, we know, is an independent predictor for unfavorable outcomes, and ARDS in patients with traumatic brain injury is associated with significant increased risk of dying or remaining in a vegetative state. With that said, we ensure a patent airway in these patients, and this means that for those of us who take care of these patients at the bedside, that we really need to make sure that tube is well secured. Just a single inadvertent extubation of this patient could cause hypoxia and hypercapnia that could have a profound uh, detrimental effect on the patient's neurologic outcome. We want to keep the PAO PACO2 preferably in the low normal range, around 35 to 38, and the PAO2 PAO2 above 60 millimeters of mercury. Typically, most centers put a little cushion there, um, say 70 or 80 millimeters of mercury, perhaps. We use mechanical ventilation. Of course, if the pressure gets too high, mechanical ventilation could in and of itself exacerbate some lung injury. We want to avoid really high intrathoracic pressures that can impede cerebrovenous outflow and perhaps uh, worsen intracranial hypertension. That doesn't mean that some PEEP may not be used in patients, particularly if it's no greater than the intracranial pressure, if you can appreciate alveolar recruitment, and if the patient has low compliance. With that said, most of these patients, particularly those with poor brain compliance, will not tolerate um, high intrathoracic pressure to recruit alveoli or permissive hypercapnia. There is a whole body of literature that supports some simple interventions to employ to minimize cerebrovascular detriment when suctioning patients. It suggests that we should pass the catheter for no longer than 10 seconds when we're suctioning the patient. We should hyperoxygenate, not hyperventilate, before and after each passage of the suction catheter, and when possible, limit the number of times you pass the catheter. Once you exceed two passages, there's a stepwise increase in intracranial pressure elevations, and attempt to minimize airway, airway stimulation. Again, really secure that tube. Positioning patients has a lot of effect on respiratory function, but it also has an effect on cerebrovascular function. We know that oftentimes turning may elevate intracranial pressure. Uh, that's not to say that we shouldn't turn our patients if they can tolerate it. Um, we want to maintain good head and neck alignment to promote cerebrovenous outflow. Avoid sharp hip flexion, which pushes that intra-abdominal content up, increases interthoracic pressure, and again can impede cerebrovenous outflow. We want to pick the head of bed position that ideally minimizes intracranial pressure and optimizes perfusion pressure. And there's a number of studies that suggest that for most patients, that's a 30 degree head of bed elevation, but that really needs to be individualized. Um, in the most recent edition of the guidelines, which just came out at the uh, beginning of October of last, obviously last month, uh, there are some specific suggestions about prevention of pulmonary infection, so I thought I should include those here. These are level 2A recommendations in the fourth edition of the guidelines for management of severe traumatic brain injury, and they do suggest that early trach, while it may reduce ventilator days, um, doesn't necessarily reduce mortality or nosocomial pneumonias, and they do uh, advise against providine iodine oral care, which I don't think most of us do these days anyway. Uh, it is going to be important to provide good mouth care to continue to wean the patient and if they can protect their airway to eventually extubate them. Uh, once their cerebral dynamics are uh, within normal limits, if you can move that patient and get them out of bed in a chair, even while their ICP monitor is in place, uh, that's a good thing for their pulmonary status. And of course, use different interventions to avoid aspiration.
And the recommendations, again, in the fourth edition, uh, deemed level three recommendations for uh, DVT prophylaxis include, again, use of low molecular weight or low unfractionated heparin. Uh, while knowing that that is helpful, it can increase risk of hemorrhage expansion, and they make note of that. Um, and they also, again, state similarly to the third edition that there's insufficient evidence to recommend a particular drug, dose, or timing for that pharmacologic prophylaxis. As far as the cardiovascular system, uh, ECG changes may be seen. There can be ST wave elevations or depressions, T wave changes, prolonged QT intervals, MI-like changes on the actual ECG, and various different arrhythmias. There also may be some myocardial dysfunction that results, sometimes referred to as a neurogenic stunned myocardium or neurogenic stress cardiomyopathy. Um, the patient may actually demonstrate segmental or global myocardial dysfunction, systolic and diastolic left ventricular dysfunction, and possibly myocardial necrosis. Now, most of these patients, as the catecholamine levels come down, will regain uh, normal cardiac uh, function. About 73% of them will. The etiology for this myocardial dysfunction is thought to be, uh, perhaps the most popular theory, is that catecholamine release that I spoke of earlier. Um, and that is what's really thought to cause a lot of this problem. There may be coronary artery spasms that occur perhaps microvascular dysfunction, or an aborted myocardial infarction. But this autonomic nervous system disruption may uh, result in some myocardial dysfunction. We also have that inflammatory response. There's fluid shifts that can affect hemodynamic functions as well. Um, associated injuries that may impact the myocardium. And of course, some of our therapeutic interventions can affect myocardial function as well, perhaps uh, sedatives, diuretics that the patients uh, had, or perhaps uh, problems with low body temperature if you're using hypothermia. Propofol infusion syndrome is a good example of an intervention that we utilize that may in fact uh, have some myocardial uh, impact. We know that propofol can be a trigger factor that can end up causing some problems with breakdown of myocardial and skeletal muscle, causing both uh, perhaps heart failure as well as rhabdomyolysis. This can all lead to problems when you have poor myocardial function and hemodynamic instability, where you have an insufficient blood pressure to provide insufficient cerebral perfusion pressure to have that pressure gradient that's needed to continue to provide essential nutrients to the brain. And of course, that inadequate nutrient delivery can result in greater ischemia. So we need to monitor the ECG and hemodynamic status, rule out other causes for arrhythmias, and of course, treat those appropriately. Normally, supportive care can get you through that period uh, where there's that profound myocardial dysfunction. And we want to optimize blood pressure to ensure adequate perfusion pressure, somewhere between 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury, having good intravascular volume. And once we have evidence that that's been achieved using vasoactives and inotropic agents to support blood pressure, and taking care when administering string interventions that may have a uh, hemodynamic impact. So I'm going to stop there just because I want to keep to my time and uh, I just want to say that clearly the brain's injury can have a significant impact on other body systems. Uh, coagulation is another big area and problems with coagulopathy can lead to hemorrhage and problems with hemodynamic stability, as can fluid and electrolyte imbalance from various different imbalances caused by brain injury, such as the antidiuretic hormone imbalance that can lead to diabetes insipidus or SIADH. So just, uh, we could go on and on about all the various different complications, but I wanted to hit on at least the first two, and I hope that you really uh, did, do leave this a brief lecture with an appreciation for what that great impact is that the brain injury has on other body systems and how that dysfunction of other body systems can come back to create poorer outcomes for the patient. Thank you so much. Thank you.